It's the spring of 1942, just a few months after Pearl Harbor. War is raging in the Pacific. Japan's vast empire stretches from Manchuria through Southeast Asia, all the way to the Solomon Islands. And in every territory it conquers, Japanese forces seize a fortune. The Japanese are actually meticulous in their ability to extract wealth, and they do so at every level. So not only will they go after things like national banks and depositories of gold bullion and silver bars, but they will also raid individual houses to amass enormous stockpiles of jewelry and other symbols of wealth and value. In some ways, the Philippines is the perfect place for the Japanese to amass a lot of the loot that they're pulling off of the mainland of, of Asia. And that's because the Philippines is an island location. It's a very easy transshipment point. There's a lot of great ports and harbors, and there's no possibility of an enemy overrunning any of those storage depots. And so what they're gonna do is they're going to consolidate the material that they're stealing in a few specific locations, and then they're going to transship it directly back to Japan. By late 1944, the tides of war are turning. MacArthur makes good on his promise to return to the Philippines, arriving with 200,000 troops. His opponent, the notorious Japanese general, Tomoyuki Yamashita. Yamashita is one of the great troubleshooters of the Japanese army. He's widely perceived as, as one of its greatest field commanders. His job is to both enhance the defenses and make it as costly as possible for any potential American invasion. The following summer, after the US drops two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Emperor Hirohito finally surrenders on August 15th, 1945. But Yamashita and his army take another 17 days to surrender, holding out in the mountains of northern Luzon, leading some to ask, what were they doing during that time? If, in fact, hundreds of millions of dollars in treasure was buried in tunnels in the Philippines during the end of World War II, then where did it go? Was it handed to a secret government slush fund, as some believe, or did it end up somewhere else? Decades after the war, one of the most infamous dictators in world history in the 20th century, he becomes part of the story. It's 1986, and the eyes of the world are on the Philippines, as notorious dictator Ferdinand Marcos is overthrown in a popular uprising. There's a lot of complaints living under a dictator, but living under the Marcoses has a very specific complaint. While the Filipinos are living in abject poverty, Ferdinand Marcos and his wife, they're living in the lap of luxury. The Marcos chapter of the Lost Gold Saga really begins in 1961 with the 17-year-old boy named Rogelio Roger Rojas. Enter Rogelio Rojas, who is born towards the end of the war in the Philippines. And keep in mind, the Philippines is an impoverished country. Uh, Rojas is born into poverty, but he's also born into the legend of this gold. And he meets this Japanese man who claims to know from a Japanese soldier where Yamashita's gold is located. So he claims to know of a site of one of these tunnels. He has a map, and he knows where it is. If he's interpreting this map correctly, it says that one of the Golden Lily vaults is actually very close to his hometown of Baju, in fact, right by the hospital. Rojas thinks he's actually onto something. In early 1970, Rojas gets a permit from a local judge to begin excavation. That judge's name is Pio Marcos. Rojas didn't really make the connection, but the judge that grants the excavating permit to Rojas is actually connected to the Marcos family. So he is part of you know, this vast network of Marcos. It connects Rojas to Marcos and to Yamashita's gold. So now Yamashita's gold is part of the Marcos story full of adrenaline, they start digging and digging, they break through, they find, you know, a whole chamber underneath them. And they look down, what do they see inside? 28 inch tall, golden Buddha, Burmese style, they've hit the jackpot. The thing weighs a ton, it's only this big. They get it up and they bring it back and he stores it in his closet because they want to get back to excavating and digging more. 
That's when Rojas claims to have found another chamber, crammed with wooden boxes from floor to ceiling. He opens one of the boxes inside, gold bars. And if Rojas is telling the truth, this is a massive quantity of treasure. It's a mind-blowing experience. It's like something out of an Indiana Jones movie. This is too much gold to move in a day. They're gonna go home, sell the Buddha, and use the money to hire more workers and get more personnel, go back open the cave, and get the rest of the gold. And Rojas, of course, wants to celebrate. He has his brother take a picture of him next to the Buddha. I've got this picture of the one thing of Rojas with this golden Buddha, and a prospective buyer comes and looks at it, tests the gold, and finds it is actually 22 carat. The mysterious buyer offers Rojas $160,000 for the Buddha. Rojas says he'll think about it. And as he's thinking about it, he's looking at this, at this Buddha, and he notices what just imperceptibly looks like a fine liner on the neck of the Buddha. So he takes this, and he looks at it, and he starts to strike. It takes a freaking wooden stick, and he starts hitting this thing until it comes loose, removes the head, and inside are handfuls of diamonds, cut and uncut. April 5th, 1971, 2.30 a.m., and there's a knock at the door, bad thing in the Philippines. Opens the door, it's the police. They come in, they arrest Rojas, they seize the statue, they later put him in jail, but guess who was there? The buyer. And Rojas knows what's going on, why? Because on the rifles, there are these little red ribbons, and that means palace guard Ferdinand Marcos. He knows who's behind this. When Rojas speaks out, he's arrested and spends the next two years in jail. The guards then torture Rojas and all of his teammates. Rojas supposedly never breaks, which makes sense. Being that driven as a treasure hunter, you're not going to break. That's your life's goal. But apparently, one of his team breaks and gives up the location. After Rojas is released from prison on November 19, 1974, he finds soldiers standing outside tents near the Baguio General Hospital. And the hospital staff later actually remembers seeing, and they've reported seeing soldiers come out of the cave behind the hospital, carrying wooden crates and putting them in military trucks. They didn't have to guess what was inside, because some of these boxes, they were rotten, and they broke up, and now they're being carried. And what falls out? Gold bars the size of cigarette boxes. To give you an extent of how much gold we're talking about, it's 10 boxes a day going up every day for a year. Rojas is certain Marcos's soldiers have found his tunnel and stolen his treasure, but there's nothing he can do, at least not for now. So Rojas is trying to figure out what he can do. He's not going to get the gold back. He decides to turn to the law, and he files a civil suit in Hawaii against the Marcoses. And this suit goes through the courts for years and years and years. It takes forever. Meanwhile, Rojas's lawsuit against the Marcoses takes another turn. The suit's still going on. Rojas dies in a fairly suspicious manner. The official cause of death is tuberculosis, but there are questions about how is it that he died. According to his family, he never had any signs or symptoms of tuberculosis. But despite his death, Rojas has one trump card still left to play. In 1993, the court hears Bob Curtis's sworn testimony. Can you raise your right hand to be sworn? You solemnly swear the testimony <clears throat> you're about to give in this cause will be the truth to help you dad? I do. Your name again on the record, please? Robert H. Curtis. Bob Curtis claims he was hired by Marcos to launder Yamashita's gold. He testifies to seeing another item in Marcos's possession, a solid gold Buddha with a removable head, the very same golden Buddha Rojas is photographed with. Curtis's testimony helps the court to come to a final decision. In 1996, the court awards the Rojas estate damages of $22 billion, the largest civil settlement in history. $20 billion is a lot of money. This was what the treasure was worth from that one vault that you found. There were 175 vaults. But even more important from like a history perspective, it's not about the money. It's the fact a court of law actually validated that the existence of these vaults, that these things were real, that Yamashita did bury these, and that this legend is actually based in fact. 